You're talking about motivation, that's it. And that's what I'm going to be talking about is motivation. West Texas rancher had a coming out party for his daughter. Now, this was one of those real rich Texans. I mean, thousands of acres of land, tens of thousands of head of cattle, dozens of producing oil wells. I mean, a great big house and an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Now, this coming out party for his daughter, us salespeople refer to that as group prospecting. I mean, he wanted to have a look of all of the fine young men in West Texas, so they came in from 100 miles away. Well, they had a marvelous occasion, and along about midnight, the host invited them out to his Olympic-sized swimming pool, which he'd had the foresight to stock with water moccasins and alligators. And he said to the young men, he said, Now, the first one of you young men who will jump in this pool and swim the length of it, he said, I'll give you 5,000 acres of my best land. And if you don't want the land, he said, I'll offer you $1 million in cash. And he said, if you don't want that, I will give you the hand of my beautiful daughter in marriage. Now, I don't have to tell you fellows this, but I think it's obvious that everybody knows that she is our only heir. And the one who gets her for his bride will eventually get all of this. Well, the words were no sooner out of his mouth than there was a loud splash at one end of that pool, followed by an almost immediate emergence of a dripping young man at the other end of that pool. He had set a world's record which will never even be approached. Well, the host was all excited. He ran down there, and as the young man was just shaking himself off from that fast swim, he said, Congratulations, son. That's absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. He says, do you want the 5,000 acres of my best land? The young man said, no, sir. He said, well, do you want the million dollars in cash? He said, no, sir. Well, he said, then, son, I've got to assume that you want the hand of my beautiful daughter in marriage. The young man said, no, sir. And the West Texan said, well, son, for crying out loud, what do you want? The young man said, I want to know. The name of that dude that pushed me in the swimming pool. <laughs> now, I think we'll all agree that he was motivated. But I think we'll also agree that most people are confused about motivation. One of the favorite questions the media often ask me is, Mr. Ziegler, now you're going to do this four-hour seminar. Yep, that's right. And you're going to get the people all motivated. I said, I sure hope so. That's what management brings me in for. Well, let me ask you a question, Mr. Ziegler. Where will these people be a month from now, six months from now? In other words, Mr. Ziegler, tell me, is motivation permanent? Well, I got to look at you folks and say, no, motivation is not permanent. But then neither is bathing. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I don't approve of bathing. As a matter of fact, I strongly encourage it. Eating is not permanent unless you don't eat, and then pretty soon your condition will be permanent. No, motivation is not permanent for the simple reason that we've got demotivation, which takes place every day of our lives. There's more confusion about motivation and positive thinking than just about anything that I have ever encountered. I believe in this presentation, though, we're going to be able to clarify much of that for your benefit, and more importantly, share with you how you can keep the motivation and the positive thinking going. Positive thinking won't let you do anything. I get so annoyed when I hear some people enthusiastically stand up and say, man, with positive thinking, you can just do anything. Just believe it in man. Think about it positive enough. You can do it. I believe that's ridiculous. See, I'm 60 years old. I don't care how positive I got. I could not whip a boxing champion. I don't care how positive I got. I could not play football in the NFL or the basketball in the NBA. I don't care how positive I got, I couldn't perform major surgery on you and have you live. Nor could I give you a lecture on nuclear physics. Positive thinking won't let you do anything, but it will let you do everything. Better than negative thinking will. Now, I know that for most busy people, getting regular exercise is about as easy as climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. 
but it can be done. You've just got to have a plan. You've got to set some goals because it's just as difficult to reach a destination you don't have as it is to come back from a place you've never been. Unless you have definite, precise, clearly defined goals, you will not realize the maximum potential that lies within you. And this applies to every aspect of your life, not just to exercise. Now, here's some steps you can take towards that end. First, identify your goals. And next, set a deadline for reaching them. Make a list of obstacles you have to overcome to reach your goals. Identify the people who can help you overcome those obstacles and make a list of skills you have and those you need to achieve your goals and then develop a plan. Now a word about goals themselves. There are seven different kinds of goals. There are physical, financial, spiritual, career, family, mental, and social. And these seven types of goals share several characteristics. First, to be effective, they must affect change. We must have some big goals because thinking big creates the excitement necessary for accomplishment. Second, you must have some long-range goals so that short-range frustrations don't stop you in your tracks. Occasionally, circumstances do arise that are beyond your control, and oftentimes, obstacles such as market changes, sickness, accidents, or family problems can be pretty intimidating. But by keeping your eye on the prize, you will find that the excitement of winning that prize will carry you through the tough times. Third, if you don't have daily objectives, you qualify as a dreamer and not as a doer. Dreamers are fine, provided they build foundations under their dreams by working daily towards them. Often, the difference between the great and the near great is the awareness that making it big means working every day towards our long-range objectives. And four, your goals must be specific, not vague or general. If you want a new home, for example, know every detail of that house. How many square feet? Number of rooms and bathrooms. The shape of the living room. The type and kind of lot. Its location. If it's a car you're dreaming about, picture the make, the model, the color, and every option you want it to have. You see, if you want to reach your goal, you must see it, be able to smell, to touch, and to taste it. Know how it looks and what it feels like in your own mind. Before you can reach that goal, you see, it is true that whether you think you can or think you can't, you are generally right. Step number six, you need to feed your mind with the good, the clean, the pure, the powerful, and the positive. Let me ask you a question. If I were to come into your living room one day with a pail of garbage and dump it on your living room floor, what do you think you'd do? I bet I can answer the question. You would either get your gun and say to me, now, Ziegler, I'll bet you can clean that up. Or you'd get on the telephone and you'd call the police. Or you'd whip me as long as I was there. Those are things you would probably do. I mean, and then for months, you'd be talking about this crazy guy came in my home, dumped garbage on the floor, ought to shot him. As a matter of fact, I wish I had. But we could clean the garbage up off your living room floor. But what about the garbage that we dump in our mind every single day? Einstein said that it takes 11 correct inputs to overcome one incorrect input. And a lot of the things which go in our minds and in our children's minds is not a thing in the world but pure garbage. I would ask you to do this. Evaluate what you read and what you view. Evaluate it in this light. Will this really help me to accomplish my objectives in life? Or is this going to be a deterrent to me accomplishing my objectives in life? 
Remember, you're what you are and where you are because of what's gone into your mind. And you can change what you are. You can change where you are by changing what goes into your mind. Now, as you probably suspect, I'm an absolute enthusiast about the uh, cassette recorder. I believe it's the most fascinating educational tool that we have in our country. I was a visiting scholar for the University of Southern California for two years. One of the things they discovered was that if you live in a metropolitan area and drive 12,000 miles a year, that in three years' time you can acquire the equivalent of two years of college education. You can learn virtually anything you want to know about finances, foreign languages, the Bible, how to set goals, how to close sales, how to plan your life. You can learn so many things while you're there in your car. Feed your mind. Second thing I would encourage you to do is start reading something good every day. Did you know if you read 20 minutes a day and you're an average reader, that at the end of the year you will have read 20, 200-page books and that the average American only reads one good book a year? Think of what an advantage that will give you over the competition in whatever field you're in. Now, who does these things? Well, Mary Kay Ash of Mary Kay Cosmetics told me that she would never get in her car without a cassette that she could listen to while she was going somewhere. H.L. Hunt, worth $3 billion at his death, listened to cassette recordings until after he was 80 years old. Wallace Johnson, one of the co-founders of Holiday Inns International, over 80 years old, tells me he listens every day and reads at least two good books every month. Alan Bean, one of the astronauts who walked on the moon, told me that the astronauts on their way to the moon and back, and please understand, these people have the best self-images, the most clearly defined goals, the most positive mental attitude. They're the most confident, competent people as a group, maybe that our country has. But these people were listening to motivational recordings on their way to the moon and back. And what a delight it is for me to be able to say that some of the recordings they were listening to were fantastic. <laughs> you need to feed your mind. Now, a lot of times people say, yeah, you know, when I'm down in the dumps just a little bit, I really enjoy listening because it gives me a lift. Well, I'm glad to hear that, but let me give you the most surprising news maybe you've ever heard. It's good to listen when you're down, but folks, the ideal time to listen is when you're sky high. Let me tell you why. When you're down, sometimes you grab at straws, and sometimes you grab the wrong straw. Also, a lot of times, and here's the real benefit to listening, it triggers your imagination, stirs up all of the stored information which you already have in your mind, and a lot of the good ideas then come forth. But if you're too down to accept them, then you turn away the very best ideas of all. Listen when you're up. And then with those endorphins popping, and they do pop as a result of listening to good motivational recordings, when you listen then and new ideas pop in your mind, it generates even more excitement. Here's what we've discovered. You need to listen at least 16 times to get the complete message. That's the reason I say, listen to this over 16 times because you will get all of it then. It will become a part of you. Let me say it again. You probably have been in the process of making decisions right now. As you listen, you will make those decisions. But as you listen over and over, the decision changes to commitment. And once you've made the commitment, then you will seek the training which will make the difference because that means behavior changes. And when you change behavior, then you start developing winning habits. And that's what this is really all about. Step number seven, if you want to build a winning attitude, you need to take time, and this is probably going to surprise you, based on what you've heard me say so far, but you need to take time to be quiet. You know, the average American sleeps 30 minutes too late. 
every day. And when that opportunity clock does sound off, they hit the floor, I mean, in a dead run. They scoot past the kiddies' room on the way to the kitchen. They bang on the door, and they say, get up, kids. we got to go to school now. I don't have to tell you again. We were late yesterday morning. Don't want it to happen again. And they scoot on back to the kitchen. They plug in the coffee, making the toaster. And on the way back by the kids' room, they bang again. Now, what I tell you, I'm not going to have to tell you again. They scoot in. They get dressed real fast. You know, they shave and apply their makeup. And by then, the kids are up. They rustle them into the uh, den, and and they set a bowl of cereal in front of them and turn the television set on, running their mind and their body all at the same time. They gulp their breakfast down, they hop in their car, and woe be to that person who dares to pull in on them when they've got the traffic jump on them. I mean, it will be too bad for them if they do. They hustle down, they drop their kids out, they rush on down to their work, and they're busy, busy all day, and in the evening they come home and repeat that process, and by the time they get ready for bed, after watching three and a half hours of television, they they are exhausted. Uh, you know what we need to do, folks? We need to take time to be quiet. You need to do it at least four or five times a week. A lot of people say, well, that guy keeps talking about time for this and time for that. I don't have time for all of these things. Let me tell you how you can create an extra three hours every day of your life, guaranteed. Get your TV guide out on Sunday afternoon. And look at the shows that you really want to see that week. Over 70% of all of the time spent watching television, you're watching things you have no interest in watching. Let me encourage you to do this. Take a slow, lazy, drifting, absolutely meaningless walk. Just almost go to sleep on the walk. Not an exercise walk, you need to do those too, but a very quiet walk. Pick out a place in your home where you can be absolutely quiet on occasion. If you have to get up 30 minutes earlier, that's wonderful. I don't know why, but I seem to wake up earlier in the winter months than I do in the summer months. And when I get up, it's pitch dark. I have a nice little office. I go in there and I turn on the gas log and I sit there and every time I do that, without exception, I have the most exciting day of my life. I simply run through my mind the things I'm going to be doing. As you plan the day, as you think of all of the things we've got to be excited about, it really does renew your energy and it gets you excited about the day. Now, let me tell you something. This is going to be one of the toughest things you'll ever do. When you sit down saying, well, I'm going to sit perfectly quiet for 20 or even 30 minutes, you will think of 2,868 reasons or things that you've got to do. You try to decide, do I raise the window or lower it? Do I turn the heat up or down? Do I get the air conditioner off or do I turn it more full blast? Do I really need to go to the bathroom? Am I going to get me a cup of coffee? What is that noise against the outside? Maybe I better check up on that. Resist the temptation. Spend a few minutes in quiet, reflective thought. It does make a difference. Take time to be quiet. Step number eight, take time for those you love. Dr. Herb True, professor at Notre Dame, outstanding speaker, good friend of mine, suggested this, which I really think is so valid. Frequently, every two or three months, you should close your eyes and visualize that everybody whom you love, really love, were suddenly, completely, totally, and forever taken out of your life. Then ask yourself the question, what would your regrets be? Would you really regret that you had not picked up the telephone and called that distant cousin, or even a brother or a sister, or a mother or father, or a son and a daughter, would it be really a heartbreaking experience because you had not called and said, you know, I'm really sorry that we had the problem. I don't know whether it was your fault or my fault, but let's get together and solve the problem. Take time for those you love. Spend time with each other. Those of you who are married, spend time as husband and wife, just enjoying each other, communicating with each other, getting acquainted with each other. Earlier I said all of the studies revealed that if there is that close relationship, then success is more likely to come your way. 
Corn Ferry International, an executive search firm in New York City, in conjunction with the UCLA School of Management, did a study on 1,362 vice presidents, men and women who were aspiring to the president's chair. Their average income was $215,000. They had spent an average of 15 years working for the company, and the most lucrative of them, those who had the highest paying of all the jobs, had had two or fewer jobs in their lifetime. They were loyal to their company. 87% of them were still married to their one and only mate. 92% of them were raised by two parent families. But the story has even more. They said they considered integrity the most important characteristic in their success arsenal. 100% of them said hard work was absolutely necessary. 89% of them had two, three, four, or more children. 71% of them also said that if they had more time, they'd spend it with their wives. 50% said with more time, they would spend it with their children. Incidentally, the average one worked a little over 50 hours each week. So they're not working those 80 and 90 hours a week that a lot of people might think they are. And they're living a balanced life. 89% of them also were either Catholic, Jewish, or Protestant, and their faith apparently had some meaning to them. U.S. News and World Report did a study of the millionaires in America. There are now one million of them. They said the typical millionaire has gotten that way because he's earned his money or her money over a period of 20 to 30 years. They do work about 50 hours a week. They're still married to their high school or college sweethearts. In other words, the family is intact. Incidentally, a couple of other little things you'll be intrigued about this. They discovered that less than 1% Less than 1%, and the implication was it was considerably less than 1%. Of all of the millionaires in America earned their money in music, radio, television, the movies, and all athletic endeavors combined, considerably less than 1%. Intriguing, isn't it? Also, they discover there are far more salespeople who are millionaires than doctors. And me being a salesman, I kind of related to that one. I thought it was neat. Now, what does all of these studies uh, really say? These studies say uh, that if we can build that relationship with those we love. Now, your family might simply be mother and daughter. It might be father and son. It might be husband and wife. It might be brother and sister. But you know who you're close to. The better you get along with the ones you love, the more likely you are to be successful in whatever else it is you do. Now, what are these steps involved? Let's do a very quick review of them. Those eight steps, number one, we decided we would not judge the day by the weather. Number two, we'd learn to look for the good in every situation and every person. Number three, we would greet people properly, whether it was on the telephone or in person. Number four, we would identify the goal lights of life for what they really are. Number five, we would take care of our physical body. Number six, we would daily feed our mind with the good and the clean and the pure and the powerful and the positive. And number seven, we would take time to be quiet, to recharge our batteries, and number Number eight, we would spend time with those we love. Now, let me give you a little warning. When you start doing the things we're talking about, when you start talking about go lights and warms and strong ends, when you start talking about super good but I'll get better, when you start talking about outstanding but I'm improving, there will be some who will criticize you. You can count on it. But let me tell you this, since the beginning of time, nobody has ever erected a statue to a critic. So obviously, they're not held in such high esteem. I might also warn you that there are some people who will laugh at you. But let me remind you that the little world laughed, but the big world gathered on the banks of the Hudson when Robert Fulton went steaming by. The little world laughed, but the big world was at Kitty Hawk when the Wright brothers made that historic flight. The little world laughed, but the big world was tuned in when Alexander Graham Bell made that phone call 
that open the lines of communication which are so important today. The little world might laugh as you set out on your objective. But let me point this out. The big world is going to be right there at the finish line cheering you across. Let me also emphasize that what you get by reaching the destinations you set in life, what you get is not nearly so important as what you will become by reaching your destination. You see, you'll become the winner you were born to be. Buy these ideas. Do these things. Take these steps. Follow these procedures because if you do, I can close by saying, do these things and I definitely will see you. And yes, I do mean you at the top. This has been a presentation of Simon & Schuster Audio. You know what positive thinking will do? Positive thinking will let you use your ability. And I'm here to tell you that is all you really need. Positive thinking won't let you do anything, but it will let you do everything better than negative thinking will. Will you buy that idea? Does that make sense to you? Okay, it lets you use your ability. See, that's what we want to communicate with you in this presentation. Now, J. Allen Peterson in his beautiful book, The Myth of the Greener Grass, points out that according to one computer study, over 90% of the input in our minds on a daily basis is of a negative nature. Chad Helmstetter in his book points out that the average 18-year-old American has been told 148,000 times no or you can't do it. But I talk about demotivation and negative input and so forth. Let me share with you just some of the things that maybe you've heard. An overweight person sits down at the table and what do they say? Everything I eat turns to fat. A parent sends a child off to school and says, now don't you get run over. I mean, uh, you know, that's about as negative a statement as you can get. You see our terminology, it's all fouled up. We wake up in the morning with the aid of an electronic rooster. And what does the average person call that electronic rooster? You tell me. Alarm clock. <clears throat> but you see, they sound the alarm when the building catches on fire. That scares people. They sound the alarm when the bank's being robbed. That scares people. If you wake up to an alarm, that scares people. No wonder they're negative. It's an opportunity clock. <laughs> well, you think about it. If you can hear it, that means you've got an opportunity to get up and go. If you can't hear it, that might mean you done got up and gone. I mean, uh, you think about it, it really is an opportunity clock. How negative are we? They bring out a loaf of bread, and what do they call the first slice? I mean the first slice on the loaf of bread. Tell me, the heel or the end? Isn't that crazy? Never saw a loaf of bread in my life that didn't have two beginnings. I mean, we really need to explore that. Now, what we want to do is we want to look at a formula. And this formula is a very significant one. William James, the father of American psychology, the man who really wrote the original books, he's from Harvard, says that if you want to change your life, you've got to do it immediately and you've got to do it flamboyantly. Now, I want to emphasize as I get involved in this, during these next few minutes, the chances are enormous that you are going to be making some decisions. And they will be good decisions. But they also will be emotional decisions, kind of like a New Year's resolution, which some people break the very next day. Decisions are easy to make. Business people make hundreds of them virtually every day of their life. Now, if that decision is going to mean anything, it's got to be reinforced over and over and over, and it's got to be done enthusiastically. Now, if it's reinforced often enough and enthusiastically enough, then the decision becomes a commitment. Now, once you've made a commitment to do something in your life, ladies and gentlemen, then you will seek the training. You will demand the training that will enable you to utilize and reach the commitment which you've made. Now, training is what makes behavioral changes in your life. 
If the training is good, that means you will develop winning habits. And ladies and gentlemen, all you've got to do is practice winning habits long enough and you yourself will become a winner. You see, we were born to win. I believe that with all my heart and soul. We were born to win. The unfortunate truth is many people have been conditioned to lose. So as we look at this formula, as I share these steps with you, I want to really encourage you to listen carefully this first time, but also repeat it over and over until it becomes a part of you. To break a bad habit, smoking, drinking, habitual lateness, being overweight, whatever, the first and most important thing you must do is decide that you really want to change. That is a decision you and only you can make. Without this motivation, no person or procedure will have any significant impact on your behavior. You must decide that you want to take control of your life, that you want to be free, that you want to do things with your life instead of having things done to your life. Secondly, if you need to, get help. Interestingly enough, many people quit their bad habits in the same way they acquired them, by associating with people who share their goals. Alcoholics Anonymous. Gamblers Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, literally hundreds of self-help organizations provide just this sort of positive association and support for people with problems. Thirdly, try substitution. There is really no such thing as eliminating a habit. You simply substitute a good one for a bad one. The psychologists say that it's important to have a new activity or habit to fill the void when you start shedding old habits. In place of eating, you might try jogging. Instead of drinking, you might try talking. In place of smoking, substitute writing. In other words, don't be unwise in your habits, but rather aspire to maturity and wisdom and keep your mind well and emotions focused on positive ideas. Step number four, use the psychological technique of imaging, of visualizing yourself as free of that destructive habit. Picture yourself as doing something else, something positive, something winning. And a final suggestion. Once you decide to grab hold of a new habit, you will need for a while to force yourself to hold on real tight, to hold on to it for all you're worth. Eventually, it will get easier and even become fun. But at first, to make it stick, to turn it into a real good habit, you've got to make yourself do it for at least 21 consecutive days. Do it for 21 consecutive days in a row, and you'll have a real good shot at beginning to live a different kind of life. You might just become a happier, more motivated, excited, and enthusiastic person. Step number one is never judge the day by the weather. Now, that sounds like a very simple thing. But suppose the weather is miserable. Does that mean you're going to decide to have a miserable day? That doesn't make any sense, does it? And yet, ever, a lot of times when I'm talking with people, I'll say, how are you doing? Well, they'll say, you know, with this weather, what can you expect? As if the weather was the only factor. I'll never forget when my beautiful middle daughter was born. Dreary, bitterly cold, cloudy, overcast, snowy day. Oh, it was an ugly day. But do you think when I looked at that beautiful daughter of mine that I had any concern about the weather out there? Step number two, you need to learn to look for the good in other things and in other people. Now, that's very, very important. Forbes magazine had a most intriguing article. They were talking about successful entrepreneurs. And in this article, they point out that an incredibly high percentage of those entrepreneurs make their money in a new location. 
Now, the new location did not matter whether it was north, south, east, or west. It did not matter whether it was rural or urban, but they invariably, or oftentimes, I should say, made their money in a new location. Now, why is that? Very simple. When they go in the new town, they are the new area. They're not familiar with the bureaucracy. They're not familiar with the problems. They don't know the things which cannot be done. They go in with extraordinarily high expectations. And expectations in life, ladies and gentlemen, are so important. You see, you're going to find what you are looking for. We have a seminar in Dallas which people attend from all over the world. We try to get the corporations and other people to send husbands and wives together because our research indicates that if the team functions together, they both will do better in whatever it is they do. There's one company sent in four couples. We have a little process whereby we separate the people into little groups or one section of where we got about eight or ten people, another where we got about twenty people, and then we have the general get-together uh, three times a day. Well, in the individual groups, they do a lot of role-playing and participation. They're very busy. And every time an individual says or does anything, the other members of that other group write them a little note that says, I like Gene Smith because. And then they use some specific observable behavior that they like about her. At the end of the three days, each one there will have from one to as many as 200 of those little slips. You're talking about motivators. People get excited about it. Well, these four couples really got turned on, and we finished at about 8.30 that evening. They went out the first night to a very late dinner at one of Dallas's finest restaurants. They hit the jackpot with a waiter. He had been there over 20 years, been a waiter over 25 years. He was professional in every way. He was there when he was needed, but he did not join the party. He was friendly, but he was not familiar. At every need, he was there. He was really great. There was a lot of interchange. They got his name. When they left, because he had contributed so much to the enjoyment of the evening, they left him a 25% tip, which is significant in a very expensive restaurant. Also, each one of them wrote him one of those little slips of paper, I like because, and they walked out the front door. They'd gotten about 100 feet when they heard his voice from the rear saying, wait a minute, folks, wait a minute. And it was the waiter running up to them. He was waving those eight slips of paper. He said to them, you know, I've been a waiter over 25 years. I've been here over 20 years. And then he broke down. And they said he could not talk for what seemed like forever. It probably was no more than a minute. He finally regained his composure. And he said, you know, this is the nicest thing that has happened to me in 25 years as a waiter. He said, I'll never forget tonight. And he turned and walked away. Cabot Robert says that there are over 3 billion people on the face of this earth who go to bed hungry every night. But he says there are 4 billion people on the face of this earth who go to bed hungry every night for some sincere, honest appreciation, a compliment, if you will. The waiter story has two bottom lines. Bottom line number one, wouldn't you love to have been at the next table that waiter served? Don't you know they got the best service anybody has ever gotten in a restaurant since restaurants opened to serve the public? But the real bottom line and the real reason I tell the story is this. The waiter said as an occasion he'd never forget the most important event of his 25-year career as a waiter. His benefits are enormous. But as great as they were, every last one of the eight received an even greater benefit. It's absolutely true, folks. You can have everything in life you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. Step number three, if you want to build a winning attitude, you need to know how to greet people properly in person and on the telephone. Have you ever noticed that most people absolutely don't even know how to answer the telephone? I challenge you, two of you get together, look up 10 numbers separately in the yellow pages and swap numbers. 
I'll guarantee you, you will be unable to identify more than three of the companies you call based on the way they answer the telephone. They snatch the phone off the hook as if it were an intrusion. What do you mean, I'll just know? I wouldn't bother you. Get them under the company, and you have no more idea than a goat who you've called. When our lady answers the telephone, she says, good morning. And you know it is not a recording that you got. Then she makes a motivational speech. Not as long as the ones I make, but she makes a motivational speech. She says, it's a great day. And people often say, Zachary, is it always a great day? It sure is. And if you don't believe it, you just try missing one of them. It's a great day. <laughs> and then, then she identifies the name of the company. Now, when I'm at home and I stress, this is when I'm at home, I frequently answer the telephone singing, Oh, good morning to you. Now, I'll be the first to admit sometimes there's a long pause. <laughs> Then I sing them another little ditty. If you don't speak up, I'm going to hang up. And uh, many times they'll say, who is this? And I'll say, whoever you want. Who do you want? Man, you sure do feel good today. And I say, yes, many years ago I decided I was going to feel good today. Now when you greet people personally, you ever notice how people greet each other? How you doing? Not too bad. How you doing? Fine. So far. How you doing? Good. Since it's payday. How you doing? Okay, since I get off in 22 minutes. And don't you love it when one of them pulls himself up to the full height and say, well, under the circumstances. I mean, it makes you wonder what they're doing under there in the first place, doesn't it? <laughs> now, instead of that old razzmatazz, when you greet somebody, and incidentally, you need to initiate the action. I jog almost always between 5 and 8 o'clock in the evening. I love to jog that time of day. And when I jog, every time I meet somebody, I always give them the same greeting. Good morning. And in 85% of the cases, by actual count, they always respond either all the way with good morning or they'll get part of it out. Good mo it's not morning, man. It's evening. I made this talk the other night in Dallas at about 8.30 in the evening. By the time we left the motel, it was 9.45. I stepped on the elevator. There was a fella on it. I said, good morning. He said, good morning. Now, what am I saying with this? I'm saying that people respond in kind. And if you want to set the tone and the pace, not only in your own life, but in your family and also in your company, this is something you can really do. Now, when somebody says to you, how you doing, instead of that old negative baloney, why don't you just tell them the truth? Get yourself a three-by-five card, and on one side write, outstanding, but I'm improving. On the other side write, super good, but I'll get better. And then when somebody says, how you doing, you whip out that card and you say, outstanding but I'm improving, and I'll guarantee you, you'll never feel sillier in your life. As a matter of fact, you won't even be able to finish it. You'll be laughing on the way, and the other person will too. I will guarantee you, if you'll do this for three weeks, you will be shocked at what happens to you as a result of it. Greet people properly. Super good, but I'll get better, or outstanding, but I am improving. Now, a lot of times people say, well, Zig, do you ever have any interesting experiences with this kind of an approach. I said, yeah, sure do. Never will forget several years ago on a brutally hot day in Dallas, I had a unique one in a cafeteria. And let me qualify this by saying that when my youngest daughter was 16 years old, the only job she could get was in the cafeteria line. Now, cafeterias are very big in the southeast and the southwest. And I had never realized just what a terrifically tough job they have on those serving lines. When I watched my daughter, I immediately made a decision. I decided that never again would I ever go down a cafeteria line again without enthusiastically greeting every person there and giving them some word of hope and encouragement if possible. But I'll never forget that hot day. Oh, it was brutal. We went in slightly after one, a buddy of mine and I did, and 98% of their business is done between 11.45 and 1.15. Well, there's only one other person in the line, and he was in front of us. And he apparently was from the same school I'm from because he was saying good things to everybody. And he'd done good until he got to the meat department. Then he said something about the weather. Now, you've got to understand, some people sweat 
and some people perspire. The lady cutting the roast beef was sweating. And when that fellow said something about the day, she reached up, she wiped her forehead, and she slung the dirt on the floor, and she said, yes, it has been one of those days. Now, you got to understand, she wasn't talking to me, but she's talking about the only day we got. And she's talking in my town, and I've got a reputation at stake. I cannot sit idly by and let a comment like that be made right there in Dallas, Texas, and me not have something to say about it. So I put my big nose in. I said, yes, it's absolutely magnificent, isn't it? She looked at me with the coldest, most calculating eyes that I've ever seen in my life, and she said, you have been out in the sun too long. <laughs> I said, no, ma'am, I've just gotten back from overseas. And I have seen children without any clothes to wear. And I've seen grown men and women without any food to eat. I've seen sanitary conditions which would turn your stomach to an incredible degree. I've seen poverty beyond your wildest imagination. And I look at you and you're young and you're pretty, and you're healthy and you're working. And I know that if you really buy in to the American free enterprise system and give this job which you've got absolutely everything you've got. I know that you can move right up in this company because I'm familiar with this company. And I know that someday you can manage this restaurant or another one like it. And who knows if you really buy into the American dream, but what someday some investors might look at you and decide they wanted you to become a part owner in the enterprise. Personally, I thought it was a magnificent, off-the-cuff, impromptu speech. And I knew that she was grateful for it. I knew that she was especially grateful for the fact that I'd taken my valuable time and given her these priceless insights which were going to make a difference in her life. And I knew she wanted to thank me for doing it, but for fear she might have missed her cues, I decided to give her a little lead-in. I said, now you feel lots better, don't you? She looked at me with even more disgust and said, you are sick. <laughs> <laughs> well, you win some, you lose some, and some are rained out, you know. Well, I got the rest of my food. I went on down to the end of the line, and my buddy and I, and we sat down, we're having our lunch, and we ran out of tea. And a lady, she had to have been 65 years old. She might have been 70 or 75, came by to serve the tea. With a sparkle in her eyes like any teenager would envy as she came up and offered the tea. I said, well, how you doing? She did a little half two-step backwards, and she said, honey, if it is any better, I'd think the deck was stacked. <laughs> I said, why don't you go tell those ladies on the serving line that? She said, oh, no. She said, if I fool around with them, I'd end up being just like they are. I don't know where she learned her psychology but she's right on the button. When I say it's important to greet people enthusiastically, I'm really talking about having the right attitude, being positive and upbeat. Having the right mental attitude is one thing most professionals agree on because it is the main reason for the success of any project. In short, your attitude is more important than your aptitude. Now, here's where you come in. You can alter your life by altering your attitude. You are not stuck with the attitude you have. Good, bad, or indifferent, your attitude can be changed. So how do you get up when you're down? Well, first, you recognize when you are down. Ask yourself, do I feel really down? Do I resist change? Am I negative when others are trying to be positive? Am I a put-down artist? Would I rather say no than yes? Second, understand that there are seldom, if ever, any hopeless situations. Only people who lose hope in the face of some situations. Third, know that the condition is temporary and can be changed. 
Fourth, you schedule your downtime. Set a time limit on how long you plan to stay down. A couple of hours for minor things, maybe a few days, even a week for the bigger disappointments in life. In any case, know which day will be your get up and go up day and get up and go. And fifth, try this new motto on for size. Go with the flow. When your boss tells you to do something, do it with style and with a smile. Instead of making excuses when a friend compliments you, just smile and say thank you instead of putting yourself down. Remember, attitude like the flu is catching, so make certain that yours is worth catching. If you wanted the flu, you'd visit someone who had the flu. To catch the right mental attitude, you must go where it exists. So begin by associating with positive, energetic people and avoid the naysayers. And before long, when someone asks you how you are, you'll respond in a positive and enthusiastic manner. Step number four is you need to establish some symbols. It seems that on every street corner in every city I go in, there are some symbols. Some people call them red lights, some people call them stop lights, some people call them traffic lights. And in reality, they've all misnamed them. They are go lights, ladies and gentlemen, and they're put there for the express purpose of making traffic go. The average person spends 27 hours a year in front of those lights waiting on the right color to come along. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been sitting there waiting on the right color to come along? You're all excited. You're all enthused. You're all motivated. You're listening to your Zig Ziglar tapes. And as you sit there, you look out the side of your eye and you can't believe it. Here sits a dude over there and he's waiting on the right color to come along too. He's got a good and firm grip on that steering wheel. I mean, he doesn't want that car to go anywhere. And he's talking to that light up there, you know, and you watch him a minute, you can't believe it. He's got his foot on the accelerator. He's racing the engine to change the color of the light. How many of you have actually seen some dodo sit there racing the car motor trying to change the color of the light? Can I see your hands? <laughs> now, folks, I hate to be negative. Matter of fact, I won't be negative. I'll be like a little boy came home from school one day and said, Dad, I'm afraid I flunked that arithmetic test. His dad said, Son, that's negative. Be positive. He said, Dad, I'm positive I flunked that arithmetic <laughs> test. I don't care how much you race that car motor. It's not going to change the color of the light. Now, let me emphasize a point. Those of you who thought it might be a little juvenile a minute ago for you to say super good, but I'll get better, or outstanding, but I'm improving. If you think that's juvenile, what do you think it is to sit there to race a car engine trying to change the color of the light? Good friend of mine, Bernie Loftick, Winnipeg, Canada, most positive man on the face of this earth. I know, I know he is. Bernie's so positive he's never had a cold. Every once in a while he has a warm. <laughs> Bernie is so positive he won't even talk about the weekend. He calls it the strong end. And you say, now wait a minute, Ziegler. Go lights, warm, strong end. Is all of that necessary? No, you can be mediocre without it. Mediocre. Who's that dude think he's talking to? Doesn't he know that I'm president of my own company? Mediocre. Doesn't he know I'm worth over $5 million? Mediocre. Doesn't he know that I was number one in the whole region last year and the year before? Mediocre. Doesn't he know that I've got my Ph.D.? Well, bully for you. I still say mediocre. You see, success is not measured by how you do compared to what somebody else does. See, you might have 10 times the ability. Success is measured by how you do compared to what you could have done with the ability which you have. You see, what I'm talking about is for you to be number one. Oh, I don't believe everybody can be the biggest and the fastest and the strongest and the smartest, but I believe you are number one when you get up in the morning and say, today, I'm gonna give it my best shot. I believe you're number one when at the end of the day you can honestly look in that mirror and say, today I gave it my best shot. That's all anybody can ask of you. And you know what? With the ability you have and the attitude you're developing, your best shot is all that is required. You'll be number one. Step number four, establish those symbols. The next time somebody asks you how to get from here to there, 
Don't say, go down to the second stoplight and turn right. Instead, write yourself a little note for the first few weeks. Uh, put it on the dash of your car. Remember, there are go lights. And then when somebody asks you for directions, you'll be ready. You say, you go down to the first go light. And you can't say go light with a straight face if your life depended on it. And you know what? You'll grin from ear to ear. The mind is an associating machine, and I'll guarantee you, you'll get results. Step number five, to build a winning attitude. To be up 90% of the time and on when you need to be, this one begins with a question. Is there anybody here who has a thoroughbred horse worth in excess of a million dollars? Okay. If you did have a thoroughbred horse worth over a million dollars, would you keep him up half the night, let him drink coffee and booze and smoke cigarettes and eat junk food? <laughs> what about a $10 dog? $5 cat? You know, actually, you treat a $5 cat better than you do a billion dollar body. And if you had a million dollar thoroughbred, you'd have the best trainer in the country. You would hire a dietitian to make certain his food was exactly right. You'd have the best facilities. You'd have an air-conditioned barn in the summertime and a steam-heated one in the wintertime. A million dollar investment. But here's this billion dollar body. Step number five really boils down to the fact that we need to take care of our health. Now, to do that, there are some very simple things to do. You need to get a reasonable amount of sleep, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Forrest Tennant, the number one drug authority in the country, in my opinion, is a consultant for the National Football League. He's a consultant for Texaco. He's a consultant for Abbott Laboratories, the Justice Department, the Los Angeles Dodgers. Has the largest research staff of anybody in the country. Dr. Tennant says that you need a certain amount of sleep. It's a must. Because sleep is the only function which permits the brain to replace certain chemicals in the body. And a lot of people who have difficulty in life can be traced directly to the fact that they've upset that balance by not getting enough sleep and by putting those chemicals into their system, which destroys that. You need a certain amount of sleep. Number two, you need to eat a well-balanced diet. Number three, you need to get on an exercise program. I'll just point out that I got on an exercise program 15 years ago. I'm going to brag just for one second. In January the 5th, 1987, I went to the Cooper Clinic in Dallas for my physical. I go every 18 months. While there, I stayed on the treadmill longer than any active player in the National Football League who's been tested, and lots of them have been tested. I'm 60 years old. I have a resting heart rate of 41. I can do things today I never could have dreamed of doing when I was 25 years old. When I got on this program 15 years ago, the first day I ran A Block, I'm here to tell you that a good exercise program will make a dramatic difference in your life. If you're over 30 or over 30 pounds overweight, get medical advice before you get started. Be sensible about it. Do not try to be a weekend hero and end up in serious trouble. Take care of yourself, but do what is necessary to get in shape physically. Now, a lot of people say, well, Zig, I know you're terribly busy. When do you have time to run? Well, I am so busy, I don't have time not to run. That's a literal truth. You see, when you exercise, you activate the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland floods the system with endorphins. Endorphins are over 200 times more powerful than morphine. And the result is you end up on a natural chemical high. And for the next two to five hours, you're far more productive, far more creative, far more energetic. I invest that few minutes in running and get back hours as a result of it. Take time to get in shape. You need to avoid poison. I'm talking, first of all, about smoking cigarettes. Every time you smoke a cigarette, you have just decided to die 14 minutes earlier than you otherwise would have died. 17 and 2 tenths percent of all the deaths in America are attributed directly to smoking cigarettes. Keep that poison out of your system. Booze, every time you take a drink, it damages and destroys brain cells. 
We now know that expectant mothers, even if they drink very, 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 very moderately during pregnancy, it has an impact. Step number five, ladies and gentlemen, you need to take care of your health. 